Hello there! Welcome to Skunk Q Productions. I'm Crown Goes Kokon. Let's get into the video. Today's video, we're going to be a continuing of our History of Israel series. And today's video, we're going to be looking at the period from 1948 to 1967. Now, if you haven't checked out our other two videos on this topic, I highly recommend that you go and watch it after you've watched this one. And also as well, stay tuned for the next two videos, which are going to be covering the period of history up to the present day. So if you like what you've seen already, don't forget obviously to hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, hit the bell button so you stay notified, and also as well check out our many other videos on a whole heap of different topics. I promise that you will not be disappointed. And also as well, once you've seen those videos, don't forget to obviously share them uh, with friends and family if you haven't, right? So <laughs> with all that being out of the way, now we're going to dive into the history of this period. So where we left off last time was with the UN Partition Plan of 1947. And within this partition plan, it obviously had a lot of issues. So whereas the Peel Commission Plan of uh, 1937, which had the idea of dividing up the land between the Jewish state and the Arab state, that plan there was a lot more representative of the actual populations. However, this plan by the UN was not that at all. So whereas the Jews made up just 33% of the population, now by the UN, they were going to be offered 56% of the land, which would include 49% of the population. And within that 56% of the land, 55% of the population there were going to be Jews, and the other 45 were going to be Arabs. So even in the so-called Jewish state, it still is a thing where the Jews are only barely making up the majority of the people there. Now, of course, in the uh, Arab part, this was 99%, but still, it was not very reflective of it because the Arabs, although they make up the majority, they make up 67% of the population of Mantri Palestine, they would only be given 43% of the land. And the remainder was going to be an international zone, which is where the city of Jerusalem was. Now, as a quick side note, the fact that this was a proposed was mainly pushed for by the Vatican, yeah, because they and other religious organizations, they wanted Jerusalem because it was sensitive to all the different faiths. They wanted that to be administered in an international zone, right? So just a little side note with regard to that. That's also part of the reason why the Vatican didn't recognize the state of Israel for many years afterwards. So of course the Arabs were infuriated by this. And this is what began the 1947 to 1948 civil war in Palestine. So the Arabs are fighting the Jews, the Jews are fighting the Arabs. And on top of that, both sides are now fighting the British who are caught in the middle. And that's something which we covered in like the previous video as well. So the British are kind of like, you know, they're caught in the middle and they're just like, we want out of this. So of course, while this is going on, the tensions are really starting to build. And this is where America decided that they were going to withdraw their support for the partition plan because the British had already abstained in this vote uh, at the UN and America now, now they could see all the violence that was happening, they were like, this perhaps isn't the best idea. However, the Arab League took this withdrawal of support as basically a green light to say that the nascent state of Israel, it can just be wiped out by us and the Americans aren't going to do anything about it. And this is where you start to have the build-up of tensions even more so. Now, David Ben-Gurion, he was the future uh, first prime minister of Israel. And what he did is he reorganized the Israeli forces. So he got the Haganah and the Ogan, who had been rival uh, Jewish paramilitaries, and he formed them together to form the Israeli Defense Force, or the IDF. So this is the Army of Israel. And what he did is he also imposed a compulsory conscription on all uh, Jewish men and all Jewish women. So the entire population was now going to be mobilized for the defense of this new state. And also as well, something to note is that Golda Meir, who was later to become the Israeli prime minister, she also raised a bunch of funds from America and they got support from other places as well, most notably from the Soviet bloc. So Joseph Stalin was very much in favour of the Zionist movement and the Soviet Union at that time was in favour of it in general. And so what they did is they used their proxy in Czechoslovakia to send arms to Israel to be able to defend itself. So there's a huge a shipment of arms to there and this really helped the war effort. So on the 14th of May 1948, there ended up being a council of 10 people and Dave Ben-Gurion was the deciding person in that vote. So there were six people who voted one way and four people vote in another way. And that vote there was to do with the Declaration of Independence for Israel. So by just six votes out of 10, 
they end up deciding that Israel was going to be an independent state. And it was upon this that the Arab nations decided that they were going to strangle the baby in its cradle. There was not going to be a partition, there was not going to be the existence of a Jewish state, not in any part of this region, there was going to be no compromise, everything was going to be completely wiped out. So with the stakes being this high, this is when Ben Gurion said that there was going to be Plan Della or Plan D. And within this plan, it's very controversial because there was an idea of if they come across an Arab town or Arab settlement in general, if they offer resistance, these people are going to have their town destroyed and they are going to be deported. If, however, they surrender, then fine. Yeah, they can you know, still w exist within like, this Jewish state. So this obviously led to the so-called Nakba, right? Or the catastrophe in Arabic, which is where the Jews came in and any town that resisted, they just ran the people up, deported them all and destroyed the town and then later rebuilt it as being a predominantly a Jewish settlement. So this obviously was very controversial and it eventually would lead to 700,000 Arab refugees. But of course, as you have all the different forces which are now converging on this nascent Israel, now it's a thing where they are having to struggle for, you know, it's a life or death kind of thing, right? They don't have the choice about, should we allow these people here in it, like if, if we can't trust them? It was really touch and go as to whether they survive or not. And actually, if they hadn't had this arms shipment from Czechoslovakia, like we said, it's unlikely that they ever would have won to begin. With. So by some miracle, in spite of everything, they were able to drive all the forces out and it wasn't just 56% of the land that they ended up having control over, it was now 78% of the land, right? And this obviously was huge. <laughs> no one expected that Israel was going to be able to pull this off, and yet somehow they did. But still, they had many, many problems. And also, it was the fact of during this conflict, right? This is the uh, Israeli War of Independence, which obviously goes by many different names. But there was a decision made. Uh, where Ben Gurion wanted uh, the IDF to go and liberate Jerusalem. However, the military strategists overrode him and said that they were going to go south into the southern region, which is where the Negev desert is. Now, you might on the face of it go, why did they do that? And the reason they did that is because Israel needed strategic depth. So this is the idea of needing buffer zones, right? So basically, the more land that you have, the more difficult it is when an invading army is coming in. So it makes more sense for you to take as much territory as possible in order to kind of uh, defend your heartland. So whereas Jerusalem was obviously strategically important and obviously very symbolically important, the Negev Desert, even though hardly anyone lived there, was actually going to be much more valuable for Israel uh, to have control over than if it was their way around. So that was something which ended up being decided. And of course, this had very long term uh, ramifications. So now you have a situation whereby Israel is borders as such are now been drawn and this is along the so-called armistice line or the kind of green line which was decided in 1949 and this is what people kind of say is the borders of it but it's not really borders because no Arab state recognized Israel's right to exist and it wasn't actually a peace deal it was just a ceasefire line right so it's a temporary pausing of uh, military action so there can be no peace really when you are still surrounded by people who want you completely destroyed and there was no arab state because egypt had control over gaza and west bank was controlled by jordan so israel in its early years had many different issues to contend with so first of all you had 700,000 new jewish immigrants coming from all over the world to settle there many of whom could not speak the same language because they came from so many different places and also within those 700,000 260,000 of them were Jews who had fled uh, from Arab countries because of persecution or just expulsion, right? So whereas we talk about the Nakba and of 700,000 uh, Palestinian Arabs who were kicked out of that land, within like, the different Arab uh, neighbouring states, there were 260,000 of them who ended up having to flee. So you had all of those issues as well. And then on top of that, you still have about 10% of the population, so 156,000 Arabs living within this new state of Israel. So how are they going to deal with all of these issues? How is Israel going to actually survive yeah, to, the, to the end of the next decade? This was the things which uh, the, the Israeli leadership had to deal with, and I think that they dealt with it in a really brilliant way. First of all, they made the official languages of Israel Hebrew and Arabic. 
So of course, the use of Arabic was used to uh, placate the uh, Arabs living within Israel, but also Hebrew was used to basically say that, look, all these Jews who are coming from all the different places in the world, this is going to be our common language. This is the language which everyone needs to learn, which everyone needs to speak. And this is how we're going to build a pluralistic nation state, right? For all these different uh, identities, all these different places, this is how we're going to build it. So now you can start to see how the forming of Israel is very difficult in those early years. You know, you had 10 years of austerity yeah, between 1949 and 1959. So it went through a lot of hardship, but still it turned out to be worth it in the end. And Israel ended up outperforming all of its Arab neighbours. So as you can see on the screen now with this graph, you can see that the GDP per capita of Israel continually went up, whereas uh, with the different Arab states, it was much lower down and it kind of stayed at a much lower level in general. So Israel in those early days still had many different things to contend with, but still they were able to overcome them all. And the most notable thing of all as well is that the Arab Israelis, right, they were given full citizenship rights, right, right from the get-go. So even though they were under military rule from 1948 to 1966, they still had the right to vote, they still had the right to sit in the Knesset, they still had the right to form their own political parties. And also many of them decided that they were going to volunteer for the IDF. So that's something to really note is that even though it was a Jewish state, it was still very pluralistic and it was still upholding the initial idea which was put forward by the Balfour Declaration. That there'd be the respect for the different religious minorities within this new Jewish state. And also as well, something which we should uh, touch on is the fact that they also had the benefit of having reparations. So we've covered this more in our video to do with the history of reparations. Definitely go and check that video out. But the long and the short of it with regard to this case here is that in 1952, West Germany gave 3 billion marks to Israel over the period of the next 14 years. And this money was used to help rebuild uh, Israel and to make it the prosperous developed country which it is today. So of course they got a lot of benefits from this, but even in spite of this, they still had to innovate. They still had to try their best yet, yeah, like to overcome the challenges which they were facing. So the money alone wasn't what made it. It was the fact of how they used that money to make Israel rich and to make it prosperous and to make it strong. So of course the picture for Israel looks quite rosy. However, it's much less rosy with regard to the, uh, the Arabs, both in Palestine and also in the neighboring regions. And the reason for this, yeah, first of all, talking about so-called Palestine, right, is that there was no idea of Palestinian nationalism before 1967, not in any concrete sense. And the reason for this is because the West Bank was controlled by Jordan and it was actually incorporated within uh, uh, the Kingdom of Jordan in the Jericho Conference of 1948. And Gaza was uh, actually incorporated within Egypt. So they had set up like a client state uh, in uh, 1949, which was called the All-Palestinian Protectorate. However, this was kind of just basically a puppet of Egypt. And actually in 1959, this was completely dissolved uh, when you had the uh, United Arab Republic. So this, for those who don't know, this is when uh, Egypt and Syria formed together to become one state. So during this time, Gaza was put under essentially Egyptian military rule. However, the Palestinians at this time were not complaining. They, 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 there was no kind of push for, we want our own state, etc., etc. They were quite happy to be ruled by the Egyptians and by the Jordanians. And in 1964, when the PLO was set up, so this is the Palestine Liberation Organization, when this was set up, it wasn't about them getting uh, independence from Egypt and from Jordan. This was about having liberation from the state of Israel. So, the, you know, they were pushing for Israel to be completely destroyed. And in that way, Palestine would be liberated as they so saw it. So you can see in this conflict, even though that was very like uh, unfairly kind of dealt with, right? In the, in the sense of like the Jews perhaps shouldn't have been offered as much land as they were in, in the partition plan. You can see how after the dust has settled, the Arabs still haven't kind of moved on from it, right? They haven't just kind of like accepted what, what's actually happened and they're still pushing for every single inch of that land to be theirs and for the Jews to have none of that land. So in 1956, you end up having the Suez Crisis. So this is where Israel teamed up with Britain and France to try and take the Suez Canal off of Egypt. Now, of course, due to American and Soviet pressures, this ended up being reversed. But of course, it left a very uh, bitter taste in the mouth of uh, General Nasser and the entire Arab world. And so tensions continued to build up throughout the late 50s and into the 1960s. 
1966, there was lots of things that happened, right? So first of all, France, which up to this point had been the chief uh, arms supplier of Israel, Charles de Gaulle, the president at the time, he decided that they were going to step away from the Middle East. So a few years before, they'd been kicked out of Algeria, and now he basically wanted to pull France out of its commitments in the Middle East, and so they were like, right, we're, we're not selling you arms anymore. So at this point here, in 1966, this is where America reluctantly stepped in and they became the chief arms supplier of the Israelis. You know, so up until this point, they had a very hands-off kind of approach to Israel. They hadn't really wanted to get involved in the whole conflict, but they end up stepping in only to maintain a balance of power within the Middle East, right? So if France isn't selling them weapons, America reluctantly end up uh, selling them weapons. And also as well, in 1966, this is where the Arab Israelis, they now had their military rule completely lifted from them. So this marks a real turning point in uh, Arab-Israeli relationships within the state of Israel, because now there was no question of them being uh, second-class citizens. They were now full uh, Israeli citizens, yeah, with equal rights and equal protection under the law. However, in spite of all this, the tensions were still uh, building, the war drums were still beating, and this is where you're having, in 1967, you're not having the Six Day War. Now we've covered this in more depth in our other videos, so definitely go and check that out. Uh, you'll learn a lot from it there. But with regard to this video, we have to end it here. But definitely stay tuned for the next video where we're going to be covering what happened after the 67 war. So that being said, don't forget, obviously, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, hit the bell button so you stay notified, and also as well, check out our many other videos on many different uh, topics, so you will not be disappointed if you go and check these videos out. And once you do, don't forget, obviously, to share them with people who have similar interests to you, because that will really help the channel to grow, and also you will have a benefit as well. And uh, who knows, you might even have some new friends uh, for, for the new year and beyond, right? So that being said, have a great day, and bye.